I'm just curious to know. How many of you actually know or have learned how you have come to the place to hold something that God ordained, God created through his providence and his power that you now have available at your fingertips to hold in your hand the scriptures of God's will and purpose and plan for his creation. Do y'all know how we have something that was written in Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic that has come to be in English, the English language, for you and me to read and understand? How many of you know the story of how we got and came to receive an English translation of God's written word? Know the story. That's fabulous. That says a lot. How many of you know who possessed the scriptures? who had all authority over scriptures and no common people, y'all would be considered common folks. <laughs> if you know who had that and who was over that, it was the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, owned and maintained possession of the Vulgate. They also maintained all scriptures. The common folks did not read it, did not touch it, did not interpret it. It was not allowed. It was forbidden for you, the common folks, to have access to the holy scriptures. And back then they were written not on books, but they were written on scrolls. They were not in chapter or verse. Most of you know that. So how did we come to the place to have what I call the forbidden book? I want to teach you this morning the importance of and how great of an honor it is for you to have in your possession the words of God. We're going to go through and I'm going to give you, I cannot and do not have the time it would take for me to go all the way back to how the original scriptures were translated, how the Catholic Church got to have possession of those texts and how we went away from the Catholic Church. How many of you know what the Reformation Act was? Anybody? You know? I know Gary does. Do y'all realize that y'all here this morning, if you're listening to me, a fat independent Baptist preacher, that you are reformed in theology? You may not be in your mind, but we and what I teach is the scriptures alone. I believe and believe that scriptures I align with the reformers, John Calvin, the original text of scripture. That's what I teach. I teach the Bible alone. I do not teach like the Catholic Church teaches and other denominations that faith is not the way, but it is by works. The Catholic Church introduced things into the scriptures that were not there. Hence we begin what I call the forbidden book. And I sat up last night and wrote a book, basically, if you want to know the truth. And I got up this morning and continued that and, and finished what I wanted. And it's not complete. It is not the complete story. 
But in the time I have allotted to me, I would like to demonstrate how much God loves you through providing you with his written word. In the 1380s, that was a long time ago for some of y'all younger, John Wycliffe was an ordained Catholic priest. He had access to the Textus Setectus. I didn't say that right, but you'll get it. He had access to the original scriptures as a Catholic priest. He was ordained. He began to study the scriptures. And he began to see and understand that the scriptures did not teach a lot of what the Catholic church was teaching. I went through seminary. I left seminary because the seminary I was attending was not teaching me the Bible, but rather they were teaching me how to herd sheep. I stood up in class one night and I said, I've been, been there for three months and I finally stood up and held the Bible up and I said, when are we going to learn this? This is what I came for. I know how to manipulate people. I worked in a prison. <laughs> I'm a liar and a thief. I know how to get my way around people. I want to learn the Bible. I'm different now. I've been given a new heart and a new mind, and I want to glorify God, and I can't glorify God if I don't know his will for my life. Teach me the Bible. Never did. Never happened. They just simply wanted me to learn teach sheep where to eat, what to eat, what time to eat, and when to sleep, and where to show up to do it all over again. I was not being taught the actual word of God. I left. John Wycliffe, being an ordained Catholic priest in 1380, spent most of his Time arguing against the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, which he belonged to. He believed they were teaching doctrines that were contrary to the scriptures. John Wycliffe championed the desire to place the Bible and original scriptures into the hands of common people. People. The Catholic Church having possession of the scriptures prevented common people, believers, from coming to the original scriptures. And the Catholic Church had a monopoly on truth. If I know the truth, but I don't tell you, I just tell you what to do then I have control over the people. Is that right? Some of you know that's how it works. I only give you enough information that you need to know. What time to be here, what time to get receive forgiveness. That's it. You are on a need-to-know basis. And the Catholic Church looked at common people as they didn't need to know. They controlled and monopolized every aspect of religion. John Wycliffe did not believe in all uh, none of the doctrines that the Catholic Church was teaching to the common people. The scriptures up to this point had only been in Latin and was controlled by the Roman Catholic Church. Now get this, if you speak English and at that time, the only religion that you had access to, the scriptures had been translated from the original text into Latin 
which you do not even speak. I, who speak Latin, can tell you anything I want you to believe. I have total authority and power over what you believe. If you control what people believe, you can control every aspect of their lives. John Wycliffe died of normal causes. The Pope's hatred for John Wycliffe was so that 44 years after John died, his bones were dug up and his remains, and they crushed and scattered them into the river. This was done to extinguish extinguish. Wycliffe's influence on the common people to have available the scriptures for common interpretation. John Wycliffe had begun to speak to the common people and tell them about the scriptures in a language that they didn't understand and it began to spread and the Pope, the priest, the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church hated this. Because they had held all power and all authority over man in that time period. Wycliffe had produced a text in the English language, or what was known as Middle English. Some of y'all read the King James Bible. That ain't even Middle English. Middle English, I can't even start to try to speak. Thus was born a reformed theology, meaning that the church, the Roman Catholic Church, had become to be found out. What had the Roman Catholic Church become to be found out of? Weren't they good Catholic believers? John Wycliffe was joined by a man by the name of Martin Luther. How many of you ever heard of Martin Luther? How many of you know what Martin Luther done? There's going to be an obstacle in what y'all's answer earlier was. And so you know who Martin Luther was, but you have no idea what he done or what he accomplished. Because a while ago I asked the question, do y'all know what reform theology is? What the reform means? There's like two people that knew. I just asked you again if you knew Martin Luther. Heads went like this. Well, Martin Luther was the one who introduced the reformed church. He understood that the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church was a farce, a lie. They were using and manipulating common people for wealth, for money. And I will tell you some of the doctrines here that they had invented that are not in Scripture. Sure. But Martin Luther sat down and wrote out every false doctrine and everything he saw that was not backed by sola scriptura. And he pinned that into a thesis. It's called the 95 Thesis, where he went to the church, him along with other reformers, and they nailed it to the door of the Catholic Church. Well, that tends to get somebody's attention if you write them a letter saying what they're doing wrong and you pin it to their door. How many of y'all have done that to a neighbor? Don't do that. It's not a good idea. Martin Luther supported John Wycliffe. John Wycliffe had been dead several years. But what John Wycliffe started, Martin Luther picked up and continued forward. It was a new way of thinking, a reformed theology. It was a new way of thinking because they weren't allowed to think at all. The Catholic Church had a monopoly on all religions. Martin Luther saw 
that the Catholic Church were teaching false doctrine. Another along with Martin Luther was the man by the name of William Tyndale. Many of you know William Tyndale. <laughs> There's a Bible in the English language called the Tyndale Bible. William Tyndale was one of the first people to write down text in the true, truer to form English language. Him and Martin Luther individualized some of the false teachings of the Catholic Church. In the Tyndale Bible, some of those which were selling indulgences in the Catholic Church. Do y'all know what an indulgence is in the Roman Catholic Church? Still continues today. Can anybody tell me what selling indulgences is in the Catholic Church? Nobody knows? Well, we have no Catholics here tonight. <laughs> so, selling indulgences is something that in the Roman Catholic Church, if, if I go out and I'm in town and I see uh, Brother Glenn, and I see he's not with his wife or his family, and he's off doing something, and I see him or catch him in sin, and the church goes to Mr. Glenn and says, Mr. Glenn, you're living uh, uh, contrary to the law. You're living contrary to God. You are in sin. And the, back then, everyone was made aware of your sin and what you were doing. Mr. Glenn could come to the church with his billfold in his hand, and he could come it still happens today. Matter of fact, in the Catholic Church, when you walk up, there's a box, usually, where you come in and you kneel, marry, uh, and you pull a sheet of uh, envelope out of that box. You can pay what are called indulgences. They don't call them indulgences anymore because back in 1380, they were called out of You can pay put money in that envelope to have your sins taken away by a priest. A priest will take that and say, hmm, we got an indulgence for Mr. Glenn. He's been doing this. I will go over here and I will pray and petition God for his forgiveness. Not only that, but it will decrease his sin according to the Catholic Church. But not only that, he has to confess it to the priest. <coughs> so you have to admit everything that you've done. If you don't admit it and tell it to the priest, you cannot receive forgiveness. There is a mediator placed in between you and God, and it is a man, a priest, who sins just like you do. <laughs> so what did Mr. Tyndale, Martin Luther, and John Wyatt could see in the Catholic Church, they saw false doctrine. It was not true. Not only that, but the doctrine of purgatory. How many of you know what purgatory is? Purgatory is the place in the eyes of the Catholic Church that if you die in sin and you haven't had all you, you ain't paid your indulgences and you've got sin still when you die, you go to a place, you don't go to hell or heaven, you go to a place called purgatory. Maybe you don't know you've heard of purgatory. Purgatory is a bad place, ain't it? How do you get out of purgatory, David? You know? You pay. Gary? My mother or my wife would have to pay my way out. There you go. Mother, wife, somebody kin to me would have to bring money to the Catholic priest. Exactly. The amount he, he said, not the amount that I say. Whatever he says. If it's just just say the priest tells you 
Debbie, when you die, you, you've got cancer, you're dying. When you die, you have sin in your life. You don't know how much sin you have. The priest has to tell you how much sin you have. You go to a place when you die called purgatory. The priest comes to your mother and your husband and says, David died in sin. She's in purgatory. And to lessen her time, she has eight years in purgatory before she can enter into heaven. For eight years, to lessen that time in purgatory, guess what? Your, grand, your mother and your husband can do. He can sell his bass boat and he can wipe out all of your time in purgatory. <laughs> or he can pay a little installment plan and let you get a time in purgatory. <laughs> <laughs> He's got to sell his bass boat he's going to be there a long time. Dude. That's right. He gets rid of for nothing on his life. <laughs> so you see what doctrines they had uncovered that did not line up with Sola Scriptura. We have the Catholic Church had been exposed as a thief and a liar. Think back in Scripture. What did Jesus do in the temple? Do y'all remember what Jesus did? Everybody loves to remember this verse because Jesus threw a fit. He went into the temple because the Pharisees and the temple leaders were in there selling what? They were selling animals for sacrifice. If you didn't pay them for an animal of pure sacrifice, you had no way to atone for your sins. They were making money off sinful people. What did Jesus do about it? He thought a fit. You made this into a den of thieves and robbers. You're doing the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, were continuing the same process. They were making money off people. That's kind of human nature, isn't it? A lot of people do that. You let somebody be at disadvantage, somebody will take it as an advantage to make money off of it. How many of you have been to the doctor? <laughs> you hear me? I went to the doctor, what, Canyon, twice the other day, spent 90 bucks, and you know what they told me? You didn't go to emergency room. <laughs> like, thanks. It still continues today, but that's on a medical level, and what the Roman Catholic Church and the early Pharisees done was they made money off of people's salvation. They had none. They had sin. They continued in sin daily. But the, back then, the law, you had to atone for your sins through a sacrifice. In the Roman Catholic Church, even though the New Testament and Jesus had come about, they continued and developed a way to maintain control over people so that they could make this. Martin Luther nailed that thesis to the door and it exposed the Roman Catholic Church for what they really were. A monopoly on religion. Taking advantage of people's spirituality and their need for forgiveness from a mighty God. Veneration of Mary. The Roman Catholic Church says that you can pray to Mary to lessen time. You can worship Mary and pray to her to shorten people's time in purgatory. You can pray for the veneration of saints in the Catholic Church. There's several things that you can do that are not scriptural inside the Roman Catholic Church. Martin Luther and William Tyndale just simply decided we need to get Sola Scriptura out of the hands and the power of the Roman Catholic Church and put it into the hands in the English language into every common man's hands. The Roman Catholic Church 
did not want this. Think about the priesthood and how big and how funded and how much money the Roman Catholic. Think about the Roman Catholic Church at that time controlled the world. Martin Luther in his 95 Thesis in William Tyndale's English Bible, the Catholic Church began hunting down and killing anyone in possession of a Tyndale English translation. Y'all hear what I said? The Catholic Church, who is still in existence today, still has the highest population of members falling to Islam is the second. Christianity, guess what we are? We are third now. The Roman Catholic Church was exposed. They hired people to go out and investigate and find people that just had, it wasn't this thick. It was just copies of pages that were just one or two pages. And if you were found in possession of a copy, you were put on a stake and strangled to death and then burned. Some, they forewent the strangling and just burned at the stake. How many of you want to be Catholic now? Now the common people could clearly see what the scripture actually taught and what the Catholic priest and the church taught did not align. They were exposed. The Catholic church was in jeopardy of losing their authority and their power over people. William Tyndale's English Bible translation had become the most forbidden book on the planet. There was nothing on the planet in this time period that would get you killed any quicker than having or speaking about the Tyndale scriptures. The Tyndale actually wound up becoming a Bible. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into all the detail it takes to explain how that happened, but it happened by a lot of people risking their lives to create pages and bring them together to formulate an English version of the Bible. William Tyndale was hunted by the Roman Catholic Church for 11 years. He ran from the authority and papacy of the Roman Catholic Church before he was finally betrayed by an Englishman that he had befriended. Tyndale was incarcerated by the Catholic Church for 500 days he was in jail. After the 500 days, then he was tried found guilty of being a heretic and tied to a stake in public and publicly strangled from behind before being burned. <clears throat> he was burned at the stake in 1536. His last word, listen to this church, this man's last words, William Tyndale, as he, before he died in 1536, from being strangled to death and then burned, his last words were, Lord, open the eyes of the King of England. Think about it. Can some of you look on the back of your Bible that you have? Pick your Bible up and look at the back of it. How many of you are holding the King James or a New King James? The most popular Bible translation on the planet. What did William Tyndale cry out before he died? Before he was murdered? 
by the Catholic Church. He wanted one thing and one thing only. For you and me to have the ability to read Sola Scriptura for ourselves in our own language. He cried out and said, Lord, open the eyes of the King of England. After the vicious death of Mr. William Tyndale, the English translation of the Bible was carried on by two men, Miles Coverdale and John Rogers. They carried the work of William Tyndale forward knowing they were putting their lives in danger each day. Now, if you were Miles Coverdale and you watched your friend for the past five years that you've been helping, secretly helping this man develop an English translation of Scripture, you had produced a Tyndale Bible and you were going around giving this to everybody you could give copies to. And there were so few copies because every time anyone got caught, guess what the copy was done? It was burnt. So there were very few copies and they were getting fewer and fewer all the time because what? There was no printing press, really. It was what? Handwritten. In October of 1535, Coverdale completed the very first Old and New Testament in the English language. It was the first New and Old Testament English speaking Bible. It was known as the Coverdale Bible. How many of you own a Coverdale Bible? None of you. You know why? Because they were 99% of them destroyed. The original, there are only two original copies of the Coverdale Bible in existence today. And you're soon to find out why. 1535, Coverdale completed the first Old and New Testament English language Bible. It was known as the Coverdale Bible. John Rogers went on to complete the second English Bible in 1537. Remember these dates. I'm not saying them just to be uh, flashy. In 1537, using the writings of Tyndale, Coverdale, and a small portion of his own translation of the text, it became known as the Matthews Bible. Now we have a correlation between Coverdale, Tyndale, all three come together to produce what was called the Matthews Bible. All these Bible translations that y'all have never heard of, how many of you got people that says, the King James is the only version, it's the perfect version. The King James is a, a very, very cr critical part of what we have today in Scripture. But it was a copy of a copy <laughs> who men died for. <clears throat> In 1539, remember these dates now. In 1539, King Henry VIII ordered Coverdale to publish what then became known as the Great Bible. Well, now you have one of the biggest Bibles. Think about it. The King James does not exist yet. It's nowhere to be found. Now, the biggest production of a Bible is called the Great Bible. It became the first Bible authorized by the King of England for public use. Wow. Now we have a Bible called the Great Bible that has been authorized by the King to be used. Now you know the Catholic Church got to be sweating bullets. They are like, oh no. <coughs> Listen to what happened. It became the first Bible authorized by the King of England for public use. It was then distributed to every known church and gathering. One copy was given to each. I've heard Gary talk about this before, so I know what, I, what I'm fixing to say, and he's going to know. It was given per church, 
and then chained to the pulpit and the re a reader was even provided so that the illiterate could still hear the word of God in plain English. How many of you knew that? That back then, the great Bible was the only interpretation we had, and it wasn't in your home. It was chained to the pulpit, and all day long there was a man employed to sit there and read it. It left that church or gathering never. It was chained to the pulpit. That's how awesome we have it now. How many of you in this Bible, some of you don't read it at home now and it's sitting on every counter you got in the house. And if this Bible was chained to this pulpit, how many of you would ever read the scriptures? Think about these things. This, this is how God brought his word to you that you might have salvation through Christ Jesus. A reader was even provided so that the illiterate could still hear the word of God in plain English. Finally, William's prayers and his last words before his brutal death had been answered by God. The king had authorized Coverdale to create what was known to be called the Great Bible. Now, the king had authorized it. What did, what was his prayer when he died? Y'all remember what he prayed? He said, Lord, open the eyes of the king. Now the Bible was being put into churches. When people start following God, what do saints start doing? How I many of you remember when you first got saved? Things get easier, things got worse. Things got worse. The flow of the great Bible across Europe had been a massive undertaking, but the problems for the men of the Bible were not over. After the death of Henry VIII, uh-oh, that wonderful king that was not Catholic, Henry VIII, He's dead now. There has to be another king. Henry VIII, his son Edward VI came to the throne and suffered from an illness and died at an early age. Now, Henry VIII's son was very much on board with what his daddy was doing. But he died of an illness. He was not king very long. And when a young king dies very young, he doesn't have a chance to have what? Children. children. Have no children. So now the throne has to have a king. He then was succeeded by a woman. Uh-oh. This is where all the other women take over, right? The woman king known as, her name was Mary. How many of you, before you were saved, went to the bar and asked for a Bloody Mary? What does it look like? It's red. Do you know where the name Bloody Mary came from? It came from Bible times. Even in your sin, the Bible was right there in your face. Bloody Mary took the throne. She was given the name Bloody Mary for a reason, church. He was succeeded by a woman king known as Bloody Mary. Mary was a devout Catholic and set out to again kill the English Bible and anyone in possession of it. King Mary was determined to return England back to the control of the Catholic Church. And she would do it by blood. Bloody Mary had a had all translations of the English Bible destroyed and murdered over 300 reformers and followers 
anyone and everyone during the rule and reign of King Bloody Mary was burned at the stake. If you were found in possession of the Great Bible, the Tyndale, any scriptures outside of the Vulgate, the Catholic Bible. All of which were tied to a stake and burned alive in view of the public eye to discourage its use. In 1555, John Rogers was caught. The publisher of the Matthews Bible was burned alive at the stake for heresy. In that time, there was a place called Geneva. How many of you have ever heard of the Geneva Bible? Nobody. Wow. Geneva was the only safe haven for desperate people trying to escape Bloody Mary's reign. People that were being hunted down by the Catholic Church and King Bloody Mary. Miles Coverdale, you know, remember old Miles. Miles Coverdale took refuge there along with John Fox in Geneva. John Fox who is the author of the Book of Martyrs. How many of you ever read and looked at the Book of Martyrs and know what it is? The Book of Martyrs, John Fox kept a record of every reformer who was killed for an English translation of Scripture. He kept a record of every man who gave his life as a martyr. He wrote it down and printed a book called the Book of Martyrs. It has every person written in it who died and why he died. You know what they died for? Because they were found either to be helping print or helping spread an English translation of the Bible or they were found in possession of one. I hope after today you will look at your Bible a lot differently. Geneva was the only safe haven for desperate people. John Fox authored the book of Martyrs which is a complete book and collection of Protestant martyred by King Bloody Mary. Under the safety of a man by the name of John Calvin in Geneva. How many of you know John Calvin? You have got to be kidding. How many of you here are Baptists? Raise your hand if you're a Baptist. <laughs> if you don't know who John Calvin Okay? I got a lot more teaching to do. John Calvin had escaped to Geneva. John Calvin is where Calvinism come from. That's how we became Baptist. There's like seven levels of Calvinism. I don't agree with John Calvin on all of them, but I believe he was right in what he done for the Word of God. Under the safety of a man by the name of John Calvin in Geneva, John Calvin and John Knox determined to produce a Bible for the church in Geneva, which would educate their family and serve as the English Bible for the church to study. So now we have John Calvin has made it to Geneva. Geneva is a safe haven outside of the long arm of the Catholic Church. The Geneva place there had, was very uh, welcoming to Protestant theology, leaving or foregoing the Catholic Church. That John Calvin had determined 
to produce another bottle because what happened when the rolling rain of Bloody Mary? What happened to all the Bibles? They're gone again. The great Bible, gone. Very few copies, if any. So they've been wiped out once again. John Calvin decided, We're, I want to produce a Bible for the church in Geneva that would educate the, my family and serve as the English Bible for the church to study. In 1516, the complete Bible produced by exiles to Geneva by Coverdale and John Calvin and John Fox and others went through a painstaking process to produce what came to be known as the Geneva Bible. Y'all ever heard of the Geneva Bible? Look it up. The Geneva Bible is one of the best productions of Bibles there is, in my opinion. For the simple reason, the side notes. The Geneva Bible was implanted with study notes that describe exactly what the Catholic Church was doing. If you want to know about end times in the book of Revelation and where the beast will rise out of and different things like that, the side notes in the Geneva Bible, the creators of that Bible, they go into explicit detail of who they think the Antichrist is, who they think will uh, be the, uh, the two witnesses in the book of Revelation, they go into grievous detail. So that was the Bible in 1516. The Bible was done so well that it included the first study notes and commentaries by the other reformers. And today is known as the very first study Bible. How many of you own a study Bible? You know how a study Bible works. You read the text, you go down below, and it gives an interpretation or the meaning of the text, an understanding of what it means and how to apply it in context. The Geneva Bible was the English-speaking Christian word, world Bible, for the next 100 years. So we had 100 years of another Bible called the Geneva Bible that was in great detail, great detail. After the death of King Mary, she died childless. There was nobody to take her place. And the Catholic Church finally realized they had lost their fight to prevent the common people from reading the scripture. So then they produced their own version of the Bible from the Vulgate translation that included many of the dissertations that the reformers like John Calvin and William Tyndale had worked so tirelessly and hard to stop. And given these lives, or given their lives in many cases. They have worked diligently to prevent what the Catholic Church had decided, hey, we're going to produce our own. Today in the Catholic Church, if you go to the Catholic Church, who runs the service? Is there any reading out of the scriptures? It's done by the priests. Today, they still maintain that control over the scriptures. But now the scriptures have been made to line up with what they teach. With Queen Elizabeth's death in 1603, remember this date? Anybody in here got a King James right quick? Very few of you, if any, will have a 1611 edition of the King James Bible. Probably none of you have it. I may have it more. You may have it. I got one over there. The 1611 was the first production. All right, we're in 1603 with King James the first of England. Where do you think the King James Bible comes from? 
right here in 1603, King James the first of England took the throne. King James knew that the Geneva version of the Bible had won the hearts of the people. Because of the Geneva Bible accuracy and super scholarship and exhaustive commentaries. The Geneva Bible was a great, great teaching tool. It was the actual scriptures, not added to, not taken away, and side notes from the actual reformers. However, King James I did not want the controversial side notes. Why do you think King James did not want the Geneva Bible's side notes? You might, can you figure that out in your head? He's a king. He's dealing with a Catholic and a Protestant war. Y'all know what Protestant is, it's a Reformed church. We've left, when Martin Luther nailed that thesis to the door, it put a dividing line between all the people that are Reformed and Protestant in the Catholic Church. You sitting here today are Protestant. You are not Catholic. So when he nailed that thesis, it separated the two. King James did not want the side notes from the reformers in the text. Anybody know why? Because the reformers in there showed where in the Bible the Roman Catholic Church, that is the false religion. And they pointed it out in the side notes and said, look here, look here, look here, look here. This is where this is going to come from. This is the city on the hill. This, this is the church that will have power of the world and the false, the, the uh, Antichrist and the false prophet. They believed that it was going to be the Catholic. So they put it in the side notes there. It was right there in plain English for you to read. The Catholic <coughs> Church has been super exposed. And they did not want that to be shown. However, King James I didn't want the controversial side notes that were included in by the Geneva Bible that seemed to directly point out the ill intent of the Roman Catholic Church. King James desired a Bible that only included the spiritual and scriptural references and did not include the side notes. King James said, a Bible for the people. King James assembled a team. This is why the King James is looked at as such a great interpretation. The King James Bible used 54 translators of the highest excellence in scholarship, the best Hebrew and Greek scholars of the day. They were divided into six groups where one group counted every letter, not word, every letter to make sure that there was nothing added to or nothing taken away. And the work of of others, they used a system of checks and balances. Each group checked behind the other. What made this Bible different from others was that the King James brought in a committee of Bible scholars to complete the people's Bible. The King James Version of the Bible was started in 1605. Y'all remember what the first Production of the King James Bible was, what year it was? It was the 1611 version. The King James Version of the Bible was started in 1605. Think about that. From 1605 to 1611, these scholars were producing this Bible, going over every letter in that Bible, every word. The project started and King James Bible was finally completed in 1611. When the first King James Bible come off the press, it was 16 inches tall <laughs> and 8 inches thick. 
and it had the blood of many a faithful Christian men and women in its journey to be in your hands today. For those of us who do not know the journey and the blessing and God's power for you to have available to you to read and study God's Word, this is just a brief overview. I know some of you are ready to get out of this place. But it's my job as the shepherd over the sheep to warn you when the wolf comes in the door and to teach you who God is and who Christ is. And I feel that you cannot and will not ever have a desire in your heart to read the scripture, to follow after Christ, if you do not understand and know what it took in the men who died. Think about this. All of us, we prayed all the time. Oh, so-and-so's got cancer. So-and-so's got a car wreck. This one's hurting and that one's hurting. But you never once stop to think about William Tyndale was burned at the stake for this. Alive. He was tied up by a church strangled on a stake and burned. Set a fire while he was being strangled because he wanted you to have the truth. And a man in those situations, you think about think about John Wycliffe. These are just two or three of the early reformers. There were over 300 people murdered by King Mary. Because they had one of these, or not this, but just a page or a part of a page in their home where they would read the same scripture over and over and over again. And they would keep it until somebody come by and said, Hey, uh, William needs that letter. And they were assembling these letters together to produce an English translation. Think about it. the Roman Catholic Church had not allowed an English version. It was only in Latin. I think it's very important for the church to let go of the world and take the time to understand how great God is and his authority and what he has given you. If you neglect to read your Bible, and you neglect to keep the Bible where if someone comes to you and says, why do you believe the way you do? And you don't have the word of God where you can stand there and show a man truth. I don't know how you can honor God. Because men died for this for no reason at all other than they loved God. A good book for you to try to look up and get a get a little view of. You probably have to do it on YouTube or something like that. Look up John Fox's Book of Martyrs. Look at the names in that. Remember how many people died just to get a translation where you and me can read and worship God. I'm going to read something in actual scripture now and we're going to dismiss for the day. It's found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing. It means without stopping. We continue to thank God every moment of every day. Because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it. 
not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God. Which also effectively works in you who believe. I want to say this and we'll dismiss. Not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of God. Because you call yourself a Christian or you had some kind of little change of mind does not mean you are a Christian. It does not mean that you are saved. The Bible says a man must be born again. That does not mean you change your opinion or you get older and you don't do the things that you once done. Being born again means to be made an entirely new creation before God who honors God in all that they do and acknowledges God in everything. If the world is more in you than God, the Bible says to examine yourself to be sure that you are in the faith. And my warning to you people and myself is to every day of your life examine yourself and make sure that you are in the faith. That you aren't just dabbling in religion. The Catholic Church was taking advantage of religion. The men who were truly born again gave their lives for God. We know if there was only one Bible in this chain in this pulpit, there would be even less people in here now than they are. None of us would show up. You know, just like I do, you let your Bible lay on the counter and you look at it, you'll talk about it, you talk about being a Christian. But are you truly a Christian? Do you truly worship God enough to read His Word, teach His Word, exhort and rebuke those who are in error and walk after Jesus? That's all I got to say. Y'all stand with me and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Examine thyself. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, I come before you, Father. We come together to worship you, to exalt your name. Oh God, how you have extended your great love for us through your Son and sacrifice, Jesus. I pray, God, that uh, we would have repentant hearts, Father. That we would turn away from the world and fix our eyes on you in the cross. Father, we give thanks for Jesus Christ and his blood who washes us clean. Father, I ask that you would just reach into the confines of our hearts. That we might know that we are saved. That we are born again new creations before God. Not just walking in the contentment of being called a Christian, but in true fellowship and true faith in Jesus Christ. So much so that our outside looks just like what we believe on the inside. Father, I know we have failures, but our failures will not and cannot define us as who we are. We are born again believers in Jesus Christ. Followers and disciples of the Most High God. I pray, God, that you continue to grow us and give us ears to hear your word taught and preached. And Father, I pray, God, that men and women would fall under the conviction and the convicting power of the Holy Spirit today, that we would repent and fall back to you. Well, God, we love you. We thank you, Jesus, for your great work on the cross. I pray, God, that you would continue to make and mold us like clay in your hand till you come. Until that day comes, let your name be praised above all names. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Love y'all. Y'all have a wonderful week.